it's 1.30 p.m. in Lagos, same time in London, and we're bringing you markets, analysis, and insights on Business Incorporated. Yeah, from Channels Television. Yes, what's coming up? IMF and the Central Bank of Nigeria collaborate to address climate change. And dollars climb to 10 months high as U.S. Fed eye another rate hike. In South Sudan, national currency gets a new name. Hello and welcome to the program again. I'm Will Ebong. Let's kick off with the markets. First up, major equities in Africa, where we've seen mostly negative sentiments at intraday. Nigeria still down, rubbing up from the negative sentiment from yesterday. Down today, marginally though, at intraday, 0.02%. Still at 66,000 levels. South Africa down massively today, 1.29%. Let's flip over to Egypt and see how EGX30 performed that intraday. On the flip side, it was in the green, 0.25%. Uh, and but Kenya closed yesterday's session in the red. Now let's see what's happening at the NGX. We want to know why we're still seeing that red close, uh, that red sentiment, uh, po positive sentiments does need to trickle into the NGX. And then Onosia Sotia and Naholo, investment analyst with Main Street Capital, is here to discuss this with us. Uh, good afternoon, Onosia. Why are we still in negative territory? Good afternoon, Will. Um, well, right now, if you look at the market, we recently got to all-time highs, you know, at around 68,000, I believe. Um, now, one thing that really pushes the market is liquidity. And for the market to uh, keep making higher highs, we need liquidity. Unfortunately, if you look at, you know, the bid-ask spread, you know, um, um, for a lot of stocks, you know, in the general market, yeah, you have liquidity, you know, in some stocks, but it's at a lower level. So what's, what, what, what we see happening right now is that price is moving down to the nearest liquidity level to hopefully gather up some liquidity uh, before we can now start thinking about you know, a, a, you know, a push upwards. So what stocks really are moving the markets? What, what's really trending at the moment? What's, what's, what stocks are investors taking profit on or selling off at the moment? What stocks are they trading or fading? Tell us about that. Uh, yeah, so we see um, a lot of activity in UBA. Um, we see some profit taking in UBA, which is expected because I mean over the last two weeks UBA has, has you know has been up like almost between twenty to thirty percent. So it's normal it's normal to see you know um, profit taking in UBA. Um, we've also seen you know slight sell offs in in um, Transcorp also. Now uh, for the I think recently Transcorp had this amazing run where I mean it went up almost. I believe by 100%, I mean, depending on where you got in. Uh, but for us here, it was almost about 90-something percent. So we expect that uh, we see some profit-taking, you know, um, in Transcorp. Now, um, UBA, Transcorp, those are two of the stocks that are pushing the, you know, the biggest, you know, the values um, in today's markets. We also have Access Bank. You know, Access Bank right now, um, of all the big banks that have been, you know, benefiting from, you know, the FX, you know, uh, the FX, you know, the floating of the FX, um, Access Bank has... Um, should I say one of the weakest, you know, um, financials? Now their financials are not weak, you know, in the sense of then they're not being in profit. They're in profit, but uh, it's just not as strong as some of the other, you know, um, competitors. So what I'm seeing right now is investors are beginning to reevaluate their positions in, you know, banks like Access, and then we've seen, you know, um, some pretty significant declines over the last few days, and even in, you know, um, even in today's markets, you know, compared to, um, 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 I guess where where it closed yesterday. You know, um, so that's those are, these, those are three, three of the stocks that we're seeing. Uh, even um, for Owando too, you know, um, investors were previously optimistic about you know um, Owando's you know moving forward with their delisting program, and even when um, they they released their uh, their 2021 results, which yeah, their profit after tax was positive, but overall their comprehensive income was negative. You know, right now um, Owando had already blown up. You know. Um, uh, for the past two weeks significantly. All right now all we see is massive profit taking. You know, and Wando is down today Wando is down about nine point eight percent today. Um but you know we see it's, it's you know it keeps moving down. So we see stocks like this and even across banking stocks, you know, um for a lot of other banking stocks we see um negative price movements, which is somewhat expected because you know um around this period 
uh, banking stocks tend to decline, you know, before hopefully, you know, maybe in a couple of weeks or months, you know, we start to see an uptrend. But for um, right now, um, we see a decline, uh, mostly led by banking stocks, you know, um, in the market. Uh, definitely for Access Bank and other banks in that sector, it's a good, you know, when the prices go down, it's a good entry opportunity for potential investors. But what do you think the market is going to close at? It's going to be positive or negative today? Where do, are you leaning oh, towards? It's definitely going to be negative. You know, like I said, the market is going down towards uh, liquidity levels. It's the lowest liquidity level, the nearest liquidity level rather is around the 66,600 level, you know, which is what we are approaching. You know, the market is already down about 0.07%, you know, um, I don't see it, you know, with, with, with the orders, you know, with, with the with the um, disparity between buy orders and sell orders in a lot of movers and shakers, you know, which is the stocks that really move the market, I don't really see you know, us closing positive today. So um, I'm <laughs> definitely leaning towards a negative closing. Okay, point. we'll just uh, keep our fingers crossed. Uh, anything could happen, Nose. Thank you so much, Nose Asotia and Naola, um, Investments Analyst, Main Street Capital, for sharing your thoughts with us. Now, let's check out the Middle East markets where most mega equities uh, closed, you know, were mixed at intraday. We've seen the Abu Dhabi index down 0.25%, Dubai also down 0.75%. Now, elsewhere, we've seen a flip from that region. Yesterday, it was negative for those two, Saudi and Qatari, but today in the green, 0.74% and 0.56% at intraday. Now, the German government uh, will reject a plan in the EU right now by the European Union to enforce building renovation standards as part of the bloc's climate goals. Uh, Deutsche Welle's correspondent Chim Pondak Chimbelu joins us from Berlin with more on that story. Uh, Chip, Germany is known as a champion of green technology. What's going on here? Well, thanks for having me. Well, this move is part of the German government's wider plan to relieve the country's struggling construction sector. In doing so, Berlin also hopes it will be able to address the housing crisis. On Monday, Chancellor Olaf Scholz met with the construction industry and presented a 14-point plan to tackle the housing crisis. The plan includes a suspension of planned energy standards. Now, that is something that has been weighing on construction activity. In fact, the construction industry has been complaining about the cost of adhering to greener standards. This will provide some relief to the sector. And then there's also the tax benefits that are planned, not just for families that want to build homes, but also for landlords. The government also wants to make it easier for commercial property to be turned into housing. It's a 14-point plan. So there's a lot in there. And all of this is part of the government's plan to help prop up the construction industry, which has been struggling. High interest rates mean it has become more expensive to take out a loan to build property. Meanwhile, Germany is experiencing a housing crisis. The government is hoping the new plan will help it reach the goal it set at the beginning of its legislative period in December 2021 for 400,000 new homes to be built every year. Uh, Chief, I'm just wondering, how could every this year. help tackle Germany's economic slowdown? Well, the uh, construction industry is the sector where activity has slowed down the most in recent months, according to surveys by the EFO Institute. Spurring activity in construction could help change that, and that could potentially have a positive effect on the economy. And for ordinary people in Germany, this is really about affordable housing. Now, that is something that is harder to find in most big cities. And households have had to spend a bigger chunk of their earnings on rent. The government is hoping to help change that by meeting its target of 400,000 new homes every year. Now, that would also have a wider economic impact. People would have more disposable income if they weren't spending as much on housing. Also, Germany needs to attract skilled workers. And when some professionals have moved here, they also have struggled to find housing. Now, I've been reading about people who have long commutes because they couldn't find an apartment in the city where they live. And in a few extreme cases, some end up even leaving Germany for another country. This is a wider issue. And it's quite clear that with its 14-point plan, the government is trying to do what it can to tackle it. But while the plan has been welcomed by the construction industry and the property sector, environmental groups are critical. They say it is a step back for Germany's climate goals. 
Mm. Well, it's definitely a step back because we know that Germany has been a forefront for climate sustainability. But what can we expect from markets today? Well, markets are expected to trade lower today. Investors are concerned about the economy and interest rates. On Monday, ECB President Christine Lagarde said the European Central Bank will keep interest rates high as long as it needs to, to bring down inflation. Investors will also be watching Spain, where the country's parliament is opening a debate on who will be the new prime minister, either the centre-right opposition leader Alberto Núñez Feijó or the caretaker prime minister Pedro Sánchez. And in terms of data, markets will be looking at U.S. housing purchases and consumer confidence. Thanks so much, Chip, Chip Bonda, Chimbelu, Deutsche Welle correspondent there from Berlin. Thank you so much for the update. Now it's time to have a chat with our London correspondent, Juliana Olainke. Yesterday, uh, the London Stock Exchange played host to Nigerian government officials and business leaders. Uh, this was led by the Minister of Finance and Coordinating Minister of the Economy, Mr. Wali Edun. All part of the roadshow organized by the Nigerian Exchange Limited, the NGX. Uh, Juliana, you were right there yesterday at the London Stock Exchange and had first dips on what transpired. Can you talk to us about any possible collaboration between the NGX and say the London Stock Exchange after yesterday's roadshow? What's coming out from that uh, meeting? Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, well, it was a great outing, um, as you quite rightly said. Uh, Channels Television were granted um, exclusive access, which was great. So we managed to see the ceremonial opening of the UK blue chip index um, by uh, the Minister of Finance, Wale Eden. He led quite a large delegation from Nigeria, which included the Nigerian Debt Management Office, as well as uh, NNPC. Um, Mere Kiari uh, was also in attendance. He, of course, is um, the CEO. And then we had other partnerships, um, which included Standbic, uh, Cardinal Stone, and Chapel Hill Denham. I think one of the main um, reasons why this was happening wasn't just um, to kind of rejuvenate brand Nigeria, which of course is important. It's part of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu's mandate. That's uh, something he said during his inauguration speech, that Nigeria is open for business. And of course, the ceremonial opening uh, just follows the NASDAQ closing in New York. But the NDX has said the goal um, was basically to highlight capital market robustness and leverage on the reforms of the president. So there was quite a bit going on uh, yesterday at the London Stock Exchange Group. It wasn't just the ceremonial bell opening. Uh, shortly after that, there was a presentation uh, by the Minister of Finance, and he went through some of the eight-point agendas, the eight priorities uh, for the president and exactly how um, the Ministry of Finance is going to be able to support that. And a massive uh, part of that support is going to come from foreign direct investment. We know that since COVID-19 and since um, the, the, the global lockdowns, foreign direct investment has really uh, fallen in Nigeria, not just in Nigeria. It's fallen across emerging market economies. And one of the best ways to get capital flows into the country is for dual share listings. And we have seen that in the past. The London Stock Exchange Group does share a very strong relationship uh, with African markets. This has been going back decades. I believe Seplat Energy is still trading on the London Stock Exchange. We have seen NNPC floated on there at some point. We also saw Zenith Bank uh, floated um, on there. So it was really great, really good day uh, for Nigeria. As I said, mostly ceremonial, but there was a lot of technical detail, lots of big um, investment banks in the room. And they did hold um, the Minister of Finance to task. It is not going to be an easy job. And even though I think a lot of people are supporting and backing of what he's doing. You can't shy away uh, from what's happening <clears throat> to the Naira, to inflation, to unemployment. So yeah, lots of um, uphill tasks, but certainly I think this administration thinks uh, that they've got things under control. Uh, certainly hope they have things under control, Juliana, because I was speaking to an analyst this morning and he's talking about we should do an in-house cleaning in Nigeria before we try to get investors back in because FX repatriation is one of the, you know, the elephants in the room here. How do they get their funds out? 
FX supply is a big issue. And if we don't have the supply, how do we get investors, you know, confidence? How do we boost their confidence that they'll be able to take their money back when they need to? And we also did see that downgrade by the FTSE Russell of our equities market. I don't know if that conversation popped up there, how they're going to change that narrative and the, the, the burning issue, the burning problem for the FX, I mean, the FTSE Russell was that our FX repatriation uh, problem issue had to be resolved. So I'm hoping this is resolved and this administration really takes it uh, seriously. Well, let's move away from that and see, you know, we've seen more flight restrictions uh, from Gatwick, you know, thousands of passengers flying to and from Gatwick have seen more flights being cancelled. Uh, looks like it's an unending wave of restrictions for UK travellers this period. Yeah, you're absolutely right, um, Will. Unfortunately, more headache uh, for anybody that wants to travel into or out of Gatwick. In fact, this uh, trouble has started on Sunday and it's going to remain in place, this um, reduction in flights until Sunday. And that's because of sickness. Apparently, um, lots of uh, staff who are working in air traffic control are ill. I believe there are supposed to be about 30 staff working at a time and about 10 staff have called in ill with short-term illness. Now, this is not run by Gatwick. I believe this is run by a third party called the National Air Traffic uh, Services. As you can imagine, Gatwick bosses are absolutely furious because with even one single delay, it costs uh, the airport uh, tens of thousands of pounds. Of course, if you're a passenger um, that has had a cancelled flight, then you are entitled to a refund um, from your airline. So, yeah, huge headache uh, for Gatwick. Just coming off the back of uh, what happened on Bank Holiday Monday on the 28th of August, uh, when there was an issue with air traffic control. So dozens of flights were also uh, cancelled just then. So this um, reduction in how many flights are going to be coming out of the airport will last until Sunday, um, we've been told. All passengers, especially if you're watching from Nigeria, because I know some people do fly into Gatwick, you must check with your airline before uh, you travel. That's what um, bosses um, have been saying. Um, it is only affecting about 3% um, of flights. But of course, if you happen to be one of those unlucky few that fall into the 3%, it's, it's not great. So yeah, uh, not great news uh, for embattled um, uh, commuters in the UK who are having to deal with industrial action too. Mm, and a lot of work we're giving to foreign travellers, checking in, is there any cancellation? I need to travel. Business, you know, wise, uh, that's a lot to do. But any reaction from the markets? Yeah, the UK blue chip index is very much in the negative um, today. Uh, so many issues, really, but I suppose the big uh, story out of the UK this morning is about what's happening uh, with Offwatt, the energy, the, the, the water regulator, um, who's issued out fines of up to £114 million uh, because there's a long list of water suppliers in the UK that haven't been sticking uh, to some of the regulations that have been put in place since 2019. It's annually reviewed against um, pollution, sewage, leakages, and uh, many of them haven't done too well, including the biggest one, Thames Water. So that pushed down uh, the blue chip index, which is um, in the red at 0.04%. The FTSE 100 slightly up, though, uh, by 0.1%. And the FTSE 250, the domestic market uh, will, that's down by 0.30%. There has been a drop in the pound consistently over the past few days, and it's still down um, against the US dollar at intraday. It's down by 0.24%. Uh, the British pound is also trading down against the euro at intraday by 0.37% and down against the Japanese yen by 0.19%, Will. Thank you so much, Juliana, for that update. It's always good to talk to you. And now more to come. Updates from the commodities market space and the US dollar rising to 10 months high. Right, th That's right after the break. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. Now the US dollar rose Today, climbing to a 10-month high after bond yields soared to 16-year peaks amid growing expectations that U.S. interest rates will rise further this year. The dollar index, which tracks the greenback against a basket of six other currencies, traded 0.2% higher at 105.88, having touched its highest level since November at 106.1 on Monday. 
And now we're going over. Now we're going over to uh, next conversation, which is we're going to be talking about cotton. Uh, global cotton prices have declined by 5.68 percent to eighty-four dollars eighty-seven cents per pound in September 2023, from a year high of eighty-nine dollars ninety-eight cents per pound in July. Also, the Economist. Uh, Intelligence Unit, EIU, is projecting global cotton demand to contract further by 0.5% in the 2023-2024 season. Daniela Omubo, day day analyst, financial derivatives company, joins us. Daniela, what is driving this decline and what are the short-term prospects for the price of cotton? Good afternoon, Amy. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. So, as we all know, Cotton is largely dem um, demanded for the production of textile used to make um, clothing materials. So as such, the demand for cotton is going to likely to move in tandem with the demand for textiles. So the major reason for this decline in the price of cotton, as well as the um, contraction in the demand for cotton, is the weak global textiles, um, the weak global textile textile market. So globally, in the past few months, textile consumption has declined owing to the slowdown in economic growth as a result of the high inflation rate and the uh, monetary policy tightening, as well as the ripple effects of the Russian-Ukraine war, most especially as textile, um, per, um, textile consumption is largely dependent on discretionary spending. So um, other reasons for this um, projection of the contraction in the demand for cotton is also as a result of the 25% tariff on U.S. cotton imports, as well as the expectations of an increased supply of cotton. So the reduction in the demand for textile is largely is the major factor, is largely pushing down the price and demand for cotton. So as for the short-term prospects for price, with the high supply and the um, reduction in demand, we are most likely going to see cotton prices fall or at most remain at current low levels. And then maybe in the long run, when the um, demand for textiles pick up, we are going to see the price of cotton rise gradually, but not up to its 22 2022 levels. Uh, so, uh, Juliana, I mean, uh, uh, Daniela, I know we have a lot to talk about this, but fortunately we're running out of time. But we'll talk about the implications, the subsequent, you know, conversations about the implications, what this means for Nigeria, losing out maybe in the cotton industry, was, even the production of cotton, if we have the, the pushing that industry at all. Thank you so much, uh, Daniela Omuba Day, the analyst, financial derivatives company, for joining us on Business Incorporated. Thank you. Now, the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, has joined the International Monetary Fund, IMF, and other global institutions to sustain the push for higher funding and strategic fiscal policies to help tackle the menacing challenge of climate change. Uh, this was disclosed at the first African Training Institute's International Monetary Fund a workshop in Abuja on climate change and macro financial policies. The director of the Second African Regional Technical Assistance Center in West Africa, Jankna, reminded the audience that the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in May issued an alarming report that the world may likely exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius in temperatures by 2027. Now, South Sudan's Committee on Finance and Economic Planning has presented the bill, which also changed the name of the South Sudanese pound to the South Sudan pound. Now, reacting to the changes during the deliberation, lawmakers from the Warab state have objected to the change, saying currency belongs to the people and not the country. However, the deputy governor of the Bank of South Sudan stresses that the change is in line with the practice in the region. Meanwhile, some economists say the change of the currency's name will require the, current, the country to change the South Sudanese pound to conform to the new name. Now that's a wrap on Business Incorporated today. Do join us tomorrow for another edition. I'm Will Ebong. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>